What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I'm Chip Walton. I'm turning this interview episode around super quick because I want to help promote a wonderful event that's going on in Norway on October 10th. And because it's going to be virtual this year, you, me, everyone is invited. You can think of the Kornul Festival in Hornendal, Norway as kind of like the homebrew con and the GABF of farmhouse beers and kvike fermented beers of Norway. It's basically a giant homebrew and pro-brew tasting with farmhouse brewing demos going on. Everybody's getting together, they're sharing their kvikes, they're sharing their kvike fermented beers. Obviously it's usually an in-person festival. This year it's going virtual. For better or worse, that's kind of a good thing to the rest of us in the other parts of the world because we're going to be able to join in and see three totally different brewing techniques happening in three different cities throughout the course of the day. In this episode, I sit down with two of the organizers of the event, the one and only Lars Marius Gashol, as you know, the author of Historical Brewing Techniques. He's kind of the world-renowned kvike hunter and documenter of these farmhouse brewing techniques. We're also going to sit down with Stig Seljaset. He has a family tradition of kvaik. He actually owns a kvaik. His family is the owner uh, and propagator of kvaik number 22 on the registry. So we talk about the festival, the good and the bad about it going virtual. We talk a lot about the point of pride, the global pride and respect that kvaik has um, kind of achieved. We just dig a little bit deeper past the festival into what is Kvike, the farmhouse brewing, what it means to the people there. But we're going to bring it full circle and tell you guys about the festival that you can be a part of on October 10th. I'm going to link the event page and how to get involved all over the place in the video description or however you got to this video. Look somewhere around it and you'll see the links. But I hope that people take this opportunity to basically immerse yourself in Norwegian farmhouse brewing for a full day on October 10th. It will also be archived after the fact, but I think it's going to be quite a unique thing to check it out live. Of course, Chop and Brew's ongoing exploration into all things Kvaik and Norwegian farmhouse brewing are brought to you with support from BSG Handcraft, Imperial Yeast, and the Patreon party people. Let's get on with the conversation with Lars and Stieg. Chop for Chop, Kvaik for Kvaik. Lars, thank you so much for joining us from outside of Oslo. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me and for promoting us. Yeah, so first I want to talk about the festival and let's let people know kind of how they can get involved in a different way than, than most years. And then maybe we'll just talk about all things Kvike for a minute. But first and foremost, in a regular year, um, not virtual festival. Kind of tell me about this, how this festival uh, goes and how it lays out and what people see when they're there. Right. Um, there's kind of two ways to participate. So one is where you get to join the traditional brewing session and one is just the festival. Um, most people coming from abroad do both, of course. So you fly to Olsen Airport, we pick you up with a bus and take you to Hornindal and put you in the hotel. And then uh, the next morning, there is a traditional brew session in, uh, in the traditional brew house. And that will be actually the, uh, the guys in Hornindal doing the brew and using their own quake and all of that stuff. And then when that's done, the festival begins. And it's, it, it mostly consists of uh, home brewers bringing their beer some of them will be, you know, people who grew up in the tradition and others will be people who just like, think this is exciting and they're, they're, you know, they're trying to brew the same type of beer. And you can walk around, you know, walk up to them, try their beer, get the samples of their quake, ask them questions, you know, just hang out basically. And then there's uh, talks from various people and uh, also commercial breweries having beers to use quake or that are traditional. So since we're going virtual this year, uh, what kind of changes to the festival uh, kind of are going on? How are you documenting that? And like from how far away do you expect people to kind of get involved? Well, I mean, the biggest change is you can't try the beer now. <laughs> and that's uh, in a way really bad because uh, 
one way the essential thing about the festival is you get you get to taste what these beers are like and the, but there's this, just no way we can do that this year so what we're doing is uh, we're live brewing in three different places in Norway and kind of uh, switching between those brews and uh, since these brewers are in different places, they use different processes. So you actually get to see uh, the differences. Uh, and then we'll have some talks. There will be um, a researcher from University of Leuven who's analyzed, let me see, 1,250 farmhouse yeast strains. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, it's crazy. Uh, and there will also be a talk by uh, Martin Sebo, who's been in Bhutan, Ethiopia, and Bolivia collecting uh, farmhouse yeasts. So that's also interesting. Yeah, uh, and we'll have some of our friends in the east pop by as well and say some things. And yeah, maybe some surprises as well. <laughs> so for better or worse, but it's 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 all online, right? You go to the Crowdcast page. And there's, there will be a video feed for 12 hours. So it's a, it's a really good idea to go to the toilet before you join, because otherwise you might miss something. <laughs> <laughs> so for better or for worse, like in a weird way, people are actually going to kind of see more than they usually would, because you're going to see a few brewers in their natural home environment doing very different things with access to everything they might need instead of like brewing in a ballroom or whatever kind of space that would have been. Yeah, uh, normally we have a, a demonstration brew in the hall at the festival. And that's, we had the Lithuanian stone beer and uh, even Lithuanian oven baked beer. Uh, but it's you know it's not in a it's not in the right setting as you say. Um, whereas now you really do get to see uh, three of the brews for real. Of course, if you do the uh, when you go to the festival, if you do the option where you participate in a, in a traditional brew session, you would get to see one of these, one of the three that we have digitally. But no way would you get get to go to Horn and Null and participate in a brew in Voss. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this version of the festival, this virtual, will obviously allow a lot of people a glimpse and some interaction and involvement. But as you know more than anybody, there is this like global realization and appreciation for at least what we know and think Kvike is because of, you know, American Yeast Labs taking it on and some people have started like Kvike swaps. Um, what is your feel kind of uh, of that? I hate to call it the globalization of Kvike, but um, is there kind of like a sense of pride? Is there a sense of protection? Like what do, what are these people that kind of own, for lack of a better word, these Kvikes kind of think of what's going on in the world right now? Uh, their main reaction seems to be pride, yeah. I think that's what Stig would say if he was able to join us. And the others as well seem to be, you know, they've been ignored in their own country and uh, not really looked up to in their local communities either because people have felt that this is this is weird and old fashioned. So uh, for them to suddenly be embraced by, you know, the world brewing community at large and including Carlsberg and the big yeast labs, that's a, that's like, that's a real source of pride for them, yeah. So there are people in Norway who, who have felt protective of the quake, but uh, not so much the people who own it. Hmm. Who, else, who else has some stake in the game, I guess? Well, I guess maybe they don't have a stake, but they feel like uh, foreigners are taking this and making money with it, and it should be us and not them. Uh, but of course, given that there are uh, zero Norwegian commercial yeast labs, that's kind of difficult to achieve. There is actually probably going to be one starting in January, but uh, we didn't have any before that. Yeah, I never thought about that. You would have thought that maybe in the last two or three years, this would have been reason enough for there to be kind of some kind of national, um, you know, you obviously have the registry, but a more like, you know, the seed farm, right? The like Kvike, the yeah. national Kvike collection. There is, uh, yeah, I guess the closest we have to a Norwegian 
National Quack Collection as my fridge in the shed, but <laughs> there no, no, no. is. Uh, my basement feels like it's catching up like awfully quick. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be the American one, right? No, they're one, you know, and I'm not. This isn't a competition, but no, they're the ones like from Ivar, or from like uh, Martin Mala, or you yeah. know, people that have just been nice enough to send. You know, granted, they are also three or four generations removed from wherever they got it, right? So these are... Yeah, some of, some of mine are removed in the same way. But um, there is actually a work afoot to um, both to do this commercial yeast lab. Um, and also um, there is what's called the Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomics or something. Uh, I think that's the correct translation. And and when they heard about Craig, they, their reaction was, well, we don't really have the resources, but we just have to do something with this because <laughs> obviously it's important and it has to be taken care of. So there there are things happening. Yeah. Hi, Stig. Hi. I see Stig. Yeah. Finally. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Hello no Stig. problem. I'm not... Uh... <laughs> Hello. I'm not so very good in... Uh computers and things like that yeah well no thanks for well good enough right yeah steeg it's Sorry. nice to meet you i'm chip uh yeah. i've been talking with lars i you know i came to norway a year ago and stayed with ivar yaiton and met ivar husdal and um so yeah i know i know a little bit but not enough to be dangerous and we're here talking about your festival um lars has kind of set up what the festival is but um would you like to kind of speak to what the festival is and um, how it's kind of like changed over the years and what you're looking forward to this year? Yeah, it's the, the festival, it's uh, started about uh, my home place, Hornendal, is, uh, has been famous about home brewing and, uh, and yeah, fiddlers and uh, singers from old days. So we had taken care of the culture very well, I think. That's why we have Kvaik taken care of in many of the farms around here. Uh, I guess that's why the, the festival was started here in Hornendal. I think it's uh, very interesting that uh, people all around the world are so interested in our way to brew. Uh, because we do it in a very simple, easy, easy way. I don't know how easy it is, man. <laughs> it, it's it's uh, it's actually simpler than your brewing process. No, it, the way they brew in Hornendal. Okay, yeah, I guess I'm only using Ivar's Saland, uh, and I get, I shouldn't say it wasn't easy, but holy lord, it was long. It was like a 17 hour brew day, which is something I've never. And the, the American homebrewer in me wanted to keep like cutting corners and figuring out how we could trim time. And he just kept saying time is the like magic ingredient. Steve, what is the, uh, what is the tradition in Hornendal then? Is it much different than what I might've seen outside of Voss last year? In, in some way it's similar, but uh, I think um, we are brewing raw ale, I think uh, they call it. And uh, that's why it, don't take that uh, that long time to brew it. Be um, if you are planning it good, have all done all the preparation uh, to, to make it all ready, have everything ready, then, well, it depends on how much we are brewing. Uh, usually now we are brewing uh, 25 kilo of uh, malt, and that is 75 liter of beer. And in six to eight, eight hours, that's no, no problem. And if we brew the double, it will be maybe yeah, four, three, four hours more. So um, uh, we don't, uh, yeah, it, it's raw ale. So, so we just take it in one step, uh, cooking the, we, we are doing it. In the easy way, maybe you, uh, Lars, can tell it better. Well, I, the big difference uh, with Voss, like you're saying, is that you don't boil the wort, mm -hmm. and in Voss that takes quite a few hours. And also, you have a much shorter mash. 
But uh, other than that, the process is almost the same. Yeah, not having to bring 200 liters of liquid to a boil probably takes a lot of time out of a brew day. <laughs> yeah, and then like in Vols, they keep it boiling for several hours. So yeah. Yeah. Th that takes a while too. It was amazing. Um, Stieg, so you you own a Kavike, is that correct? You own number 22? I'm not sure of the number. Uh, Lars can confirm that, but um, I own some quite, yes, that's right. Is it Stalin? Is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah. Stalin, because that's where I'm, I'm brewing my own uh, beer. And uh, that is, uh, uh, when I was a kid, we got horses and built a house. And uh, the first 20 years we had uh, horses up in that. That's why we call it the... Uh, in Norway, where you get the, the horses, we call it stallia. It means the stables. Stall. Yes, the stable. And, um, and uh, that's why we call it stallion bruggeri, because there has be, uh, been brewed uh, uh, pretty many thousand liters of beer uh, from uh, in the middle of the, uh, about 1980 and up to now. In the first year, I guess it was about almost sometimes 500,000 uh, liters a year. You mean 500 to 1,000, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. So uh, that's uh, why Stallian uh, was obvious to, to use that name on, uh, on, on the brewery because uh, we were was always up at Stallian and brewing and tasting some beer and that's why I call it uh, Stallian. Can you just tell me a little bit about your brewing history? But I think this is something that Americans kind of don't wrap their head around. Um, how does a family kind of realize they have a Kavike and then how do they kind of maintain it and nurture it to, to kind of keep it alive, keep it thriving? Well, the quite we have, uh, I got it from my father and he got it from his grandfather who had it in about 1870. Um, and earlier they had um, a piece of wood with many holes in it, drilling holes. And um, we yeast the quite in. And when they was brewing, they put the, the, the piece of wood down in the, in the, it wasn't beer. What are you calling it, Lars? Wort. Yeah, the wort. Putting it down and have it there till, till the beer was start uh, going of itself. And th then they took it up and uh, took it away and had it on a dry pl place. So it was drying. It, it couldn't. The stand wet. It, it was very important to get it dry. So it didn't get anything on it. And then later they dried it, put it in paper, gray paper, whatever, put it in a dry place. That was one way to do it. And uh, that's the way it has been to up to the about 19. 50s, 60s, then we dry it and put it in the freezer. And it stayed there till the 80s, kind of? Yeah, if you have dried it well and you put it in the freezer, it can stay there for years and years and years. What would you say, Lars? I, th I think uh, Chip is wondering, you say there was this change in the 50s, 60s, but it sounded like you were starting brewing in 1980s. So what happened in between? Yeah, I, I was talking about the quike, how to, how to, to keep the quike. Uh, the brewing has been the, the same all the way. My father learned me how to brew. Uh, well, I was seeing how he was brewing, and uh, I started helping him when I was uh, about 13 years old, I guess. 12, may, maybe not that much. But then I started helping them with, uh, with the malt to making it ready. And I have seen how they was brewing. And my father, he learned from his grandfather in the 30s, 40s. 
And uh, my grandfather, my grand grandfather, he learned in the 1870s. So it's just my father between how I am brewing and how there was brewing in in 1870, 1880 maybe around that. Uh, uh, so it, it's just my father between uh, one link from then and up to now. So I think. I think it's very, very similar to how they did it uh, 100 and uh, almost 50 years ago. I don't know if this is an answerable question, but so when I look through all of the different strains and I think about families kind of having them or discovering them, I don't know, is this in like barrels and what like, is there a kind of like an original Kavike Lars and everything kind of branches from that or are these wild yeast that just don't really ever take on that really, really wild character? They kind of are more reined in? Um, well, there is, there, there must have been a single uh, yeast strain that all of these quakes come from. Uh, we can see that genetically, that they're all, you know, they're all a family and they must descend from a single, actually a single cell originally. Uh, but that one cell must have lived, you know, a very long time ago. And uh, even the first one uh, was not a wild yeast because uh, quake was created by two yeasts mating. It's, it's a hybrid. I, I use quotation marks because it's a hybrid within a, a single species. So then it's not really a hybrid, but two very different yeasts mating. And one of those uh is in the was in the beer one family so it's you know closely related to us05 and uh, uh german hefeweizen yeast and all of those so our continental uh beer yeast came to norway probably in western norway it met this other yeast that we don't know what it is and quite came from that but that's that's a long time ago yeah like a long time ago right mm. yeah um you know and kind of speaking of like the longevity and the tradition, there is an effort, uh, like a full on UNESCO pitch, right? You guys are trying to get kind of UNESCO qualification certification for, is it kind of for traditional brewing as a process or is it more uh, for Kavike as almost like an agricultural product? They say, well, I, it's not us uh, doing the application. It's uh, um, Western Norway Cultural Academy that's what they're called. Uh, and uh, they are UNESCO trained and they, they know all this stuff. And they say they are doing the application for Quake, but then when they describe the details, I get the impression that it's really the, the traditional brewing as what they call uh, immaterial heritage. You know, it's not like a Quake ring or old buildings, which is material heritage, but it's the, it's the knowledge of how to do something. Mm. Yeah, and then Kavike is inseparable from that anyway. So in a way, you're kind of getting Kavike under the umbrella. Um, Stieg, we were talking a little bit about the worldwide appreciation, this newfound appreciation for Kavike. Uh, is that something that excites you or do you feel a little protective about it and a little weary of what everybody's intentions are with it? Well... <clears throat> Everybody can get quite in some way anyhow. So I think it's better to, to share it and um, because of the interest. Because um, I love beer, I love quite, and I think uh, everybody should uh, know about it, taste it, because there are so many different tastes in, in quite. Uh, everybody has, every quite has its own uh, you can ask Lars, every quite has its own special taste, just a little different from one to another. Uh, and we don't always get the same taste. And um, I think that's very exciting. And um, that's why I think that um, people all around the world should um, yeah, have the opportunity to taste it and to, yeah, to discover it. And that's kind of the, the disadvantage of the festival being virtual, right, this year instead of in person is like 
usually you would just have these tables set up and you would taste this full range of smoky, raw, hard-boiled, fruity. And, uh, and I think that um, that's very, very nice to have Voss with that that's special way to brew taste for it all with uh, our way to brew and and our special taste and stirred all with their taste because that's three very different tastes and so um, I think that can be very interesting because uh, it's three different way to make beer on. So what would you tell people, Stieg? Uh, you know, we're doing this conversation to kind of promote to Americans, for the most part, watching our little web show about why they might want to kind of spend a Saturday on the internet watching people in Norway brew and enjoy beer. Like, uh, what do you think? Why should they come and hang out with you guys? Uh, I think because they, uh, especially here in Hornendal, they can see how we easy you can brew and how little things you have to make a, a good beer if you are taking care of cleaning everything and be very yeah be very careful about those things you don't have to know too much about beer and don't have to investing all that money to can brew and get a good beer and yeah, have a good experience. So that's what I think of when we are brewing to show how easily we can do it. So people, yeah, whatever they are in the world, uh, can try it and to do it in, in, in the way we are doing it. I think that's a very easy way to do it. The video nerd in me wants to ask real quick, just how are you guys going to technically pull this off? Is there just kind of like someone with a camera in all of these locations and you're kind of giving them their cues to move along? Yeah, we, um, uh, we are trying to show the, okay, uh, around the area where we are, maybe take a little picture around so you can see the nature and maybe get a little bit of feeling why we are doing yeah, yeah, how, how we are, where we are. Uh, so you can see that and then um, see the people that are there, maybe tell some short stories uh, about brewing and, um, and uh, yeah, our experience of, of brewing in, in, yeah, when we are doing different things in the brewing. Uh, we are, we are, uh, several uh, we, we, uh, it's not only me mm -hmm. I got uh, a lot of friends will be there and we are discussing how we are doing every step in the in the brewery oh uh, yeah that's what I was gonna say it's it's gonna be kind of like this uh, zoom thing that we're doing now right where you're switching between three cameras except that we will have four because uh, me and another guy will be sitting right here and kind of being the studio in a way uh, so we will be, you know, saying, okay, now we need to see what the guys are doing in Horn and Null, and then we'll change the view, and Stieg and his friends will be on there, and then we switch to Voss, and we switch to Stier Dahl, and yeah. But with the, with this uh, crowdcast, it's pretty easy to do. Kind of like you would do it here, but uh, I think Stieg is just going to use a laptop for the filming. Yeah, a, a laptop. With, I have a camera, and an extra camera on it, and okay. now we have we have got an, uh, a better connection with, with yeah. the line out. Yeah, and in Stjordal, they will actually have somebody from professional TV production to help them. Oh. And in Voss, they also got some kind of technical help. But uh, So it will be a mix of solutions. But uh, the, the studio will be my laptop sitting yeah. here on this table. Kvike TV, Kvike Broadcasting System. KBS. <laughs> yes. Um, for anybody who can't make it in real life time, will the stuff kind of live somewhere archived, do you know? Do you plan? We were planning to uh, upload the video on, on YouTube. 
Okay. So if you do have to go to the toilet during the 12 hours, then you can watch those minutes you missed on, on YouTube later. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll point people to all the websites in the video description or in the post where however you came to this video, look somewhere around it and we're going to put the links. I really appreciate you guys taking some time out of your evenings to tell us about this, man. I'm looking really forward to it as, as somebody who's, gotten pretty obsessed about the traditional side versus like the u.s you know the yeast labs that we get here it's just i love what you guys are doing it's been so fun to watch and and meet a lot of really open-hearted open-minded people like to your point steve like just sharing this doesn't seem like there's anything but good that can come out of it really yeah i i really hope so i'm uh, looking forward to to uh, show uh, everybody how nice it is how the nature i think that's a part of in how we, we are doing it and uh, yeah we we really loved it so i i love to really love to show it to you how how we are doing it and and the nature around cheers thank you so much have a great festival i'll see you virtually you. there <laughs> yeah yeah great thank you so, thank you